All right, good evening. Welcome to Conan Science Cafe. So this evening we have Will Chardon, who's a master's student at ETH Zurich. He's been here in Kona these past few months um, on uh, Werner T's farm, working on a thesis research project. He's been working on co-composting coffee processing waste and yard waste. And he was just telling uh, me before we started that uh, he'll go back to Switzerland for a while and then uh, after finishing up his credits, he's going to, going to Cambodia for another internship. Uh, so doing more composting related stuff was kind of exciting. We're traveling all over the world. Uh, anyway, without further ado. Well, please do. Uh oh, we seem to have lost him. Oh, uh, I'm here. I'm here, but. Okay. My connection is kind of unstable, but right. I think I'll get started by, uh, by sharing my screen. Yep. So, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first and foremost, I would like to, to thank you all uh, for being here with me tonight. It's very exciting. It is is, uh, this is the result, I mean, the first result of uh, many months um, of uh, research here on the, on the farm, together with Beatrice and Werner. And um, I would like to, to talk to you here about smart composting that could lead to 100% uh, 100, 100 sustainability. And of course, uh, many could argue that there are, there are several ways of explaining sustainability. And um, I'm going to to limit myself to uh, agricultural production um, sustainability. My uh, presentation here will be about the co-composting system um, of uh, the integration of yard waste digested from a biogas reactor and uh, biochar from wood burning uh, on a coffee and fruit farm here on, a, on, on, a, on the island in, a, uh, in the Kona. Before I get started, I would like uh, first to um, tell you a little bit of, uh, about this, this picture I chose uh, for the first slide background. Uh, this is, uh, as you might have expected, uh, the, the, skull, uh, the, the skull head of a, of a bird um, lying on top of a composting uh, pile that I, that I used to, to do before uh, the whole study design that I will present you after. And uh, we can see uh, actually some pieces of, um, of uh, banana leaves, meaning that the composting, the composting process is, uh, uh, the, the picture was taking, taken uh, approximately five days after the launching. And with that, I'd like to, uh, to, to write and share with you, if you don't know it already, a, a, pages, a, a small paragraph of a, a book I've been reading here on the, on the island, uh, Les Miserables from uh, Victor Hugo, written in 1862. Paris throws five millions a year into the sea. And this without metaphor. How and in what manner, day and night? With what object? Without any object. Without, with, what, with what thought? Without thinking of it. For what return? For nothing. By means of what organ? By, mean, by means of its intestine, its sewer. Science, after long experiments, now knows that the most fertilizing and the most effective of manures is that of man. The Chinese, we must say to our shame, knew it before us. No Chinese peasant goes to the city without carrying back at the two ends of his, of his bamboo two buckets full of what we call filth. Thanks to human fertilization, the earth in China is still as young as in the abyss, as in the days of Abraham. Chinese wheat yields 120 fold. There is no guana comparable in fertility to the detritus of capital. A great city is the most powerful of stair careers. To employ the city to enrich the plain would be a sure success. If our gold is filth, on the other hand, our filth is gold. What is done with this filth gold? It is swept into the abyss. We fit our convoys of ships at great expense to gather up at the South Pole the droppings of petrols and penguins. Wants to know if we're out of 
and the incalculable element of wealth which we have under our own hand, we send to the sea. All the human and animal manure which the world loses, restored to the land instead of being thrown into the water, would suffice to nourish the world. These heaps of garbage at the corners of the stone blocks, these tumbrils of mire jolting through the streets at night, these horrid scavengers' carts, these fetid streams of subterranean slime which the pavement hides from you, do you know what all this is? It is the flowering meadow, it is the green grass, it is the marjoram and thyme and the sage, it is game, it is cattle, it is the satisfied low of huge oxen at the evening, it is perfumed hay, it is golden corn, it is bread on your table, it is warm blood in your veins, it is health, it is joy, it is life. Put that into the great crucible, your abundance shall spring from it. The nutrition of the plains makes the nourishment of men. So I thought I would uh, start with uh, this, this small paragraph uh, of this great book, uh, because Obviously, composting uh, has been has been in, in humans' head for a long time, and um, I think this emphasizes the fact that it can and still is be of great value to the people, especially here on on Hawaii Island. So now let's get starting. I will um, I will start with the farm presentation. Um, and especially the you know the the climate and its its crop uh, crop being harvested, we fo will follow the current waste uh, situation of the farm, um, knowingly its quantities and like its quantities in terms of production, how and how uh, and since when it is uh, it is being managed with the biogas reactor. Then I will go uh, on with the composting process, its and its pot potential benefits. Um, to to the farm and especially the farm soil. Uh, with that, I will I will explain a bit more about the digested and biochar. What benefits does it does it does it exhibit? What challenges? What ex obstacles uh, do we have and did we face to actually uh, integrate these two amendments to the composting system? I will follow. I will then present uh, the the study design. Uh, so I mean by that how I did um, study the digested and the biochar together with the yard waste in order to to understand uh, the pot this potential potential benefits and challenges that will that I will talk about. Some results will be will be followed. Not all of them, I'm afraid, but I think uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll be able to. To present some decent uh, things in order to conclude, and uh, with what I mean, with what I with what I I hope, give you a take-home message. So, this is the farm presentation. Um, the superficy is 1.2 hectares, meaning approximately three acres uh, here on, a, on on in Kona, um, approximately 500 meters above the. The, the airport that I actually have here right now in front of my eyes. And it lies on a 18 to 20% uh, slope. The climate is uh, subtropical and semi-arid and benefits to approximately 2000 millimeters uh, of rain uh, with, uh, with an average uh, temperature ranging from 20 to 30 Celsius degrees. I would like to, to say that uh, it's, it's important to realize that this you know the the, the the precipitation patterns are very unstable, and they, um, as in typical subtropical uh, environments, they follow uh, a he heavy uh, heavy uh, rainfalls um, events followed by what can be what can be extended periods of drought. The soil is typically a uh, island, since uh, the farm lies on. Uh, on the, on the surface of the still active volcano called Hualalai, actually the last uh, eruption date of 1801. So the soil uh, is uh, extremely young in terms of uh, pedology. Um, it, uh, it is then composed of 80% ba basaltic rocks uh, and 5% soil containing 15% organic matter. Um, I would like to say that basaltic rocks exhibit high and a high important amount of plant nutrients um, and uh, 
together with the climate conditions, it is very likely that all these, these nutrients are just, you know, leached out from the soil mattress. Um, so we're not, uh, we are not facing a, a, an importantly depleted uh, situation here in terms of nutrients. The pH is 5.4 to 6.2, um, generally talking. Uh, so this is for all our land and not especially for here on the, on the farm. So uh, again, it's very typical for us, the, the environmental conditions uh, of this farm, pretty acidic. So something important is that the, the permeability, the, what, the hydraulic conductivity is extremely high here. Uh, together um, with uh, the, um, the low soil uh, fraction and the high, uh, high rock fraction and the slope, whenever there is rain or whenever there is any kind of liquid fertilizer applied on land, everything flows extremely rapidly throughout the soil. The farm produces um, 200, 208 coffee trees, 18 breadfruit trees, 18 avocado trees, and um, many other uh, species. Uh, I would like to, to um, note the, the mango trees, banana trees, some lychee trees also. You know, uh, uh, Beatrice uh, is, uh, is um, taking care of her garden. And since I've been here for now five months, it's, it's, incre it's, it's incredible how, you know, how is she, she's doing a great job. And uh, it requires a lot of labor and a lot of water and a lot of nutrients as well. This is why the irrigation water here is, I mean, it's not only because of the garden, but because especially of, of this, uh, what I've presented is about 749 cubic meters per annum. And um, for you to know, this is very, uh, it's quite considerable. And um, Werner uh, has, has provided me with the information that, he's, that this amount has been increasing throughout the years. And, um, I would also like to, to, to tell you that if this is the amount of irrigation water here on the land, uh, it is also important to know and to notice that the farm is, is a part of Makalei Estates, which comprises approximately 60 to 80 uh, um, farming lots. Um, and about three fourths of uh, all the, of these properties are involved in uh, farming activities. So we can, we can, you know, extrapolate that the irrigation water pumped per, per, like pumped for all of these uh, these farms are kind of alike. So this is this is serious uh, water that is pumped uh, from the county uh, system. There are approximately five to eight, eight people here uh, on the on the on the farm um, for farming activities. So the farmers and uh, the the labor force uh, that that comes here weekly, they, the intern, myself, uh, and other who actually uh, regularly come here on the island, um, and uh, the Pacific Coffee Research Company, which is uh, specialized in uh, coffee, um, coffee education and, and roasting and tasting, um, and the renter who doesn't uh, take part in any in any ways in uh, farming activities, but she's also you know consumes water and she produces waste. Talking about waste, this is the current waste situation. Um, so the current waste production in terms of kilograms per year. So the most important waste produced, I mean, organic waste, I would like to, to, to tell you. Organic waste produced here on, on site is fruit and kitchen waste, yard waste, wood, coffee pulps, and digestate. The fruit and kitchen waste uh, comprise, you know, all the unedible, the, the, um, the unused uh, fruits that were uh, harvested here on the land. And also, or for example, you know, the fruits such as breadfruit who, uh, who are not, who, uh, who just fell down on the, on the ground and the food scraps from, uh, from the, um, the farmers. It represents 1200 uh, kilograms per annum. And this is, this is constant. So it represents two to five liters per day. Uh, so meaning approximately one, uh, one gallon per day. Yard waste uh, comprises mainly leaves and weeds and grass. And this, is, uh, this, this amounts to 10,000 kilograms per annum. Wood 
from from uh, you know uh, coffee tree trimming and the forest cutting uh, in order to prevent any kind of uh, fire wood uh, uh, forest fire risk about 60,000 kilograms per annum the coffee pots from uh, used actually for by the biogas reactor uh, feedstocks uh, represents 629 kilograms uh, per annum and um, the digested so where the digested uh, is the output material of the biogas reactor and uh, if you want um, like the biogas reactor is sort of an agricultural stomach uh, that produces uh, an output material, which is a digested. Uh, I don't wish to go uh, any further in uh, any kind of metaphor with uh, the human stomach, uh, but you get the idea of what digested is, I guess. And um, the farm produces quite, a, quite an important amount of digested per day, since, it, uh, since in a, in a full, full speed uh, situation of the biogas reactor that produces gas, with the coffee bulbs um, waste, produces 40 liters uh, per day. So 10, uh, 10, um, 10 gallons per day, being 1,460, 14,600 kilograms per annum. So with that, um, we, uh, we have selected the three major uh, organic waste here produced on site, with, uh, which, which are obviously yard waste, wood, um, and digestate. The question was, what do we do with it? And before, uh, before I landed here on Hawaii, before my project started, the main um, organic waste management was to, you know, um, transport this waste all the way to the county transfer, tra county transfer station. Not digested. Digested was directly thrown out to the land uh, in the idea that it could, you know, provide nutrients to the soil. But we'll come to this later. And this, uh, this, is, this is a system by itself, transporting waste, but it, it requires time, it, re it requires labor to uh, actually load the, the waste material <laughs> into the truck. It, it requires uh, also uh, uh, gasoline and, and, uh, and money. So uh, composting uh, just came as, a, as the organic waste to treat these this three kinds of waste. The compost uh, as, a, as an end value end product from the composting process exhibit many benefits to the farm. And uh, so here I've made up a, a small uh, um, star diagram like uh, with slides in order to, to, to just show some and the major benefits of the compost to the, to the land. First and foremost, of course, the closing nutrient cycle on the, on the land, meaning that since uh, we, since we since all of the, of the organic waste uh, are taken out of, of this farm and um, not giving back to, to the farm system, the, the trees obviously need some more nutrients. Uh, and this is provided either by the basaltic rocks, but it needs time to, uh, for erosion. And this is also provided uh, by fertilizers. So yes, the farm uh, uses fertilizers uh, for, for its, uh, its crops, especially for uh, coffee trees and breadfruit trees. Second, um, the, um, the cation exchange capacity is enhanced by the compost uh, application to, to the soil. Uh, take cation exchange capacity uh, as um, the, the, the ability of the soil to retain uh, nutrients to the plants. And actually since it, um, the, the, the CEC, so cation exchange capacity is uh, Mainly, uh, mainly provided by the, the humus content in the soil. And I, I, would, I wish to recall you that the, the farm soil is only 5% of the whole mattress with 80% rock. Uh, the CEC is not extremely high, not, not to say it's not, it's not, it's, it's actually poor. Uh, and the compost uh, is basically um, uh, mature, uh, is decomposed organic matter. Um, uh, composed of humic substances, and humic substances um, are basically humus. And humus is, uh, is responsible for approximately 80% of this CEC. Cation exchange capacity is, if you, wa if, if you want uh, the chemical terms of it, is the, the you know, the centimoles, uh, micromole per, um, 
per kilograms um, of soil. So it just increases the, 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 the retention capacity of the cations. Um, it also provides aeration and gas exchange because uh, of the high um, high porosity uh, and the strong structure of, of the compost itself. So if uh, there is um, if there is humus and if there is a, a good structure um, that is amended to the soil, it has the ability to increase the aeration. So to provide oxygen to the soil uh, matrix, and this is good to prevent any kinds of anaerobic uh, digestion, uh, and then you know to provide a good to, to provide and create a good microflora uh, within the soil matrix. Uh, because if there is no oxygen, then there will be um, there will uh, there will be more uh, anaerobic digestion, and this is not good uh, for the production of good uh, you know mineralized. Um, um, uh, uh, elements uh, who are, that are nutrients to the plants. So air is important in the soil and this can be provided by porosity that is high in compost. Compost uh, is uh, made of a, a high uh, negatively charged um, surfaces and the negatively charged surfaces uh, has the ability uh, to create age bonds with water molecules. Um, to keep it, to keep things simple, once you apply compost on your on, on soil, uh, the water is, is retained by the compost. And this is extremely important with regard to the 749 cubic meters per annum uh, that is pumped uh, from the county transfer station. And um, Applying compost on a regular basis uh, really has the potential to decrease, uh, the, the, um, decrease the, the dependency of the farm uh, upon the, um, the county irrigation water. Also, the compost um, exhibits, you know, uh, many, many, um, um, many uh, organic, uh, organic chemicals that show antibacterial, antifungal uh, properties, uh, you know, such as quinones or phenols or, uh, or, or enols. I mean, all, all these chemical uh, moieties are just known to be, you know, to, to be uh, detrimental to, uh, to pathogens uh, and to, to, to a lot of different fungi. fungi. And uh, this is uh, very interesting in terms of uh, weed suppression uh, here on the on the on the site, uh, because uh, approximately eighty percent of the you know of the time uh, uh, of uh, required for farming here is for weed uh, de-weeding the, the soil. Then um, I would like to add uh, uh, another another word about the nutrient holding uh, capacity. So we've talked about the cation exchange capacity, but nutrient for, for, for plants are not only cations. So, you know, uh, cations, I mean salt with, with a positive charge, but also negatively charged uh, uh, nutrients and uh, such as nitrates. So NO3 minus or phosphate, PO4, three minus. And these are extremely important for plants, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, and this can uh, be increased by uh, the, the humic substances that 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 is a, a complex uh, complex molecules, a very macro molecule, in which these nutrients are sort of trapped and enclosed in this matrix. And this is very interesting for plants uh, in order to, for example, um, stop the use of fertilizers. So now a word about how does composting process work if we are to, to do composting here on, this, on, the, on the farm? So basically the composting process is uh, um, respects three, three uh, important phases. The first phase is, as you can, as you can watch at the beginning of, uh, of the graph here, um, is, um, so first, uh, excuse me, I would like to, uh, to explain this graph. So on the x-axis, it is not written, but it, this is the time uh, in month. And the y-axis, this is the temperature. Why uh, isn't the, the, the x-axis uh, shown? Because uh, the composting process, if it is uh, very important in terms of time, you know, it changes uh, the, the time for, uh, for the, for, to reach all of these phases. 
changes with respect to what kind of composting uh, uh, method do you use and the climate and many different things. So just to make clear, the x-axis is the time. So af normally, after, uh, after a couple of days, not even a week, uh, the, the highest temperature are reached. And this is called the, the thermophilic phase. It's, it's when it's the phase of the composting process that exhibit the highest temperature due to a high uh, you know, bacterial uh, activity. And um, this is also during this time that most weed seeds uh, should be destructed. Uh, so would pathogens, you know, pathogens which cannot sustain at such high temperature, high temperature being up to 71 Celsius degrees. And this is, uh, this is very important. And also it triggers the, the you know, the, the, the organic uh, decomposition, organic decay of easily uh, decomposable uh, moieties, such as proteins, um, you know, uh, carbs, lipids. Then follows the, the meso mesophilic phase, as you can see, just after this, this uh, the mountain. And the thermophilic phase is from 50, 50, uh, 50 uh, Celsius degrees to uh, four, four, uh, 40 Celsius degrees. So this is, uh, this is important for um, the biodegrade, biodegrade organic uh, matter biodegradation by itself. Uh, and then as time goes by, um, you know the, the the compost pile goes to 35 to 30 degrees, and this is go this is good for microbial life. So, just a take home uh, take home take home message for the composting process. The composting process functions uh, with regard to these three phases, and this is very important to respect these three phases. If if you don't see uh, with respect, if you don't see the high uh, the increase in temperature with, with respect as a function of time, it means there is something wrong. Um, the four main things to take into account for the composting process, as I've said, is temperature, but also the aeration, because composting is, um, is um, an aerobic uh, process, meaning it's not just like, for example, the biogas reactor, it's not anaerobic, it's aerobic. Uh, it means that it requires oxygen, for the bacteria to, uh, to, to lead to organic matter decomposition. So it needs oxygen. The third uh, most important um, feature of a composting pile is the moisture, is the water. Uh, it's extremely important uh, for, for two reasons, of course, because uh, bacteria that are responsible for organic matter decomposition, also fungi and actinomycetes, but mostly bacteria. Uh, require water for their own, you know, their, their, own, uh, their own life, just like as humans do. But also, um, it, it, uh, it, moisture is used as, um, as a nutrient transport uh, uh, complex uh, for, uh, for the composting pile. So it is used uh, to actually transport nutrients throughout the composting pile to the, uh, the, the bacteria. Then the fourth thing is the CNN ratio. By the CNN ratio, I mean the, the ratio of carbonaceous material divided by the nitrogenous uh, um, material. And for the composting pile and composting process to be uh, perfect, it needs to be between 20 and 30. So you, you, we need to have 20 times more carbon material to nitrogen material. I mean, basically. Um, actually, it's, uh, the CNN ratio is based on the, on the dry matter content of each material that you add onto, into uh, your, your composting pile. Um, for example, you know, fruit has a CNN ratio of approximately 25, uh, meaning that it has 25 times uh, 20 that, that a fruit uh, a fruit is made uh, like let, let's take a banana peel. It's made of twenty. It, it is made of twenty-five percent in dry matter of carbon and one percent of nitrogen in dry matter. So this is uh, the composting process and the, the major things to look after uh, for it to be well maintained. Now, if we are to co-composting digestates, 
what are the obstacles? Uh, digestate first should be considered as a as um you know as a, as a material, just as banana peels to the composting pile. However, digestase is uh, is dangerous. is a is a is a is a dangerous material to use because it has a pH of eight to eight point five, and um, the this pH is uh, is extremely not extreme but it's pretty basic, and with regard to the ammonia that is contained in the digestate. Um, Ammonia becomes very toxic when it reaches a pH of 8.5, and it, it is toxic to bacteria in the composting pile. So uh, this is uh, this is um, digested is is a material that is extremely high in, uh, in nutrient content. However, it exhibits some some toxic effects to the bacteria. Um, let let us have a look at the table I've provided you with. You are, look, this is the this is a digested parameter of the, this digested produced here on site, and um, the parameters have been uh, have been uh, measured by Beatrice in the Kona Community Hospital uh, about a month ago. It pH has actually is actually eight point five, uh, which means that the ammonia uh, does exhibit some toxic effects to the bacteria in the digest uh, in the composting pile. Second. Um, it has a new year content of 8.2 um, the 8.2 grams per 40 liters. All of the all of the, the the numbers, the data are given in grams per 40 liters. Why is that so? Because um, 40 liters is the amount of digestate produced per day. 40 liters. So there is 8.2 grams produced per day in the digestate here on the farm. Ammonia, there is two grams uh, produced per day, which is important, which is important. Uh, it's 50 ppm, meaning it's 50 micro micrograms of ammonia, NH3, per kilograms um, of digestate, of liquid digestate, raw digestate, directly away from the biogas reactor. And um, this is important um, because the soil uh, perfect, I mean, the soil optimal nitrogen content would be approximately to 100 to 200 ppm. So we see that ammonia here is 50 ppm, which means it's important. The phosphorus content of the digested is 1.4, calcium is 7, magnesium is 3.16. So this is, uh, this is, these are not ex uh, uh, particularly high, um, high data, high, high amounts, but uh, it is important to keep in mind that this is produced every day, every day. So this is a, this is a, a very interesting source of nutrients uh, for both for the plants, but also for the composting pile. Um, then, you know, I've put the reference here, um, and the reference is from the bio. It's from uh, the the book. Uh, uh, it's like the, the biogas uh, reactor bible, and it uh, it presents a. a a treatment of digestate page uh, in which they uh, they refer the what should the digestate contain in order to be interesting for uh, for con for composting, and uh, of course you know these data uh, these numbers are ex extremely higher than uh, than what we have here on the farm, but uh, it is important to know that the reference data is from the swine manure uh, whose content is much, much uh, more important. So here we are with digested. It has some very interesting, you know, uh, very interesting uh, uh, nutrient content. Um, however, the fact that it is directly thrown out to the soil uh, is, is, actually, is not the best way to treat digested. Why is that so? Because of what I said about the ammonia toxicity at this pH, uh, so once in the soil, the bacteria in the soil will be uh, will be affected by the toxic effect of ammonia. Second, the ammonia at this pH is very volatile. Actually, uh, ammonia um, at pH 7.2 becomes volatile, meaning it just vanishes throughout the atmosphere. So if whenever the digestate is applied to the to the land. Uh, 
uh, only a very tiny fraction of the content of ammonia, so this two uh, gram actually goes through the, 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 the soil. But since there is a high permeability in the soil, it's most likely that ammonia uh, is leached out throughout the soil. Um, so is nitrate, so NO3, um, NO3, so this is another form of, of uh, nitrogen, and phosphate, PO4. So these, you know, ammonia, phosphate, nitrate are all um, charged chemical moieties. Because it's charged chemical moieties, it means it is very soluble in water. Because it's very soluble in water, it is much likely that it will leached, it will be leached out throughout the soil, also because of the high slope here on the farm. Then the, the last um, you know, obstacle of using digested uh, directly to the land is the high amount of organic C, as we can see in the urea uh, content of digested, because urea content contains uh, high amounts of organic C and nitrogen. And once uh, it is in the soil, if it's not volatilized or if it's not leached out, it is, it is more likely to be immobilized by the, the bacteria. And if it's immobilized by the bacteria, because it's a high amount of nutrients for the bacterial life, it is not available to plants. So the main purpose of uh, applying digested to the land is to provide plants with nutrients, but it is immobilized by bacteria. So it is not likely the, the best way to treat that, uh, digested. Then the positive things about digested, despite, you know, despite the, um, the, um, the nutrient content is it's high moisture content, because I, as I said, raw digestate is about 5% solid. So 95% of digestate is liquid. Uh, since compo a composting pile needs a high amount of moisture, it is interesting in this regard. Uh, and nutrients, of course, and we've talked about this already. Uh, a quick word about calcium and magnesium. Uh, uh, you know, Kona and uh, Aa land are known to be depleted in those uh, in those nutrients. So it, it is it is in interesting. Uh, sorry, I think I needed. I lost actually a slide. I needed to talk about my co-composting biochar, but it seems that it just vanished somewhere. But uh, if uh, you are okay, I will just talk about this with this slide. Sorry about this. Um, so digest it. Um, no, no, biochar. Biochar provides many, uh, many benefits to, uh, to the composting process as well for, for different reasons. And the, 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 the main reasons is the properties, the chemical properties of biochar itself, and um, the, the you know the, the the behavior of biochar in the composting pile. Why is that so? Because biochar uh, is um, is composed uh, of seventy five percent, seventy five to eighty percent uh, highly stable carbon. So by stable carbon uh, moieties, I mean phenol groups quinone groups and enol, you know, carbo carboxylic acid. If you're not, if you're not familiar with this, this word, it's not, it's okay. It's just, I would like to emphasize the fact that biochar is, con is, uh, is um, you know, made of highly stable carbon molecules. It also contains 15 to 20% uh, oxygen. Uh, oxygen, you know, uh, that, that is, um, that is uh, um, contained in these highly stable molecules, such as the one I've, I've, I've talked about, phenol, quinones. Um, so these, these actually molecules exhibit a high redox uh, active, uh, activity. By redox activity, uh, it means that it is uh, likely to, um, to provide Election accepting um, uh, uh, moieties, and which is extremely interesting for bacteria in the composting pile. So, biochar is composed of chemical molecules that exhibit high redox activities, and this 
this you know this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, phase of biochar is extremely interesting for bi uh, bacterial life because a redox um, because being being uh, an electron accepting uh, molecule uh, an electron accepting body means that the bacteria can live with it like let's let's take you know uh, the uh, the electron accepting uh, form or molecule is like toilets for human uh, <laughs> you know we eat and then we need to go to the toilets and if there is no toilets well okay we can go to the to the wood but it's more convenient to go to the toilets right i mean we are we are all more likely to to live a better life if we have clean toilets uh, so so are the bacteria if they are if they have an electron accepting moieties that are contained in biochar so it triggers bacterial life. Um, second, uh, I would like uh, to uh, to add that theoretically, for the composting um, for the composting process, uh, biochar provides a high uh, porosity and a high surface area. So the biochar itself um, is about three hundred um, square meters per gram. So if you take one gram of biochar, it has the, the, its surface is 300 square meters. So it's about one, uh, one to two um, football fields per one gram of biochar, which is extremely high. And um, together with the biochar properties, it provides a, a, a high, a, a, the perfect environment for bacteria to thrive. Second, the biochar provides a, a, an important uh, moisture, uh, moisture holding uh, capacity to the biochar uh, to the composting pile, since it has this this uh, this negatively charged everywhere by the molecules of the biochar, and so thus it re it retains water, which is very interesting for the the, the the composting pile because then we wouldn't have the farmers don't have to add water on a regular basis. You just add once or maybe twice or three times and then the biochar retains this moisture and it's good to go. Um, third, the pH of biochar is about 8 to 9.5, which is interesting because the first stages of uh, the composting actually leads to decrease in pH, which might, which might impair the bacterial uh, life. One might think that is um, not interesting with regard to the digested, uh, digested pH of 8.5. You can see here 8.5 digested of pH. Um, and uh, the biochar pH is 8 to 9.5, so it's extremely basic. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll come to this right after this slide. The aeration. You know the oxygen, uh, the oxygen, um, the aeration, the, the oxygen provided by biochar because of its high porosity, and thus it allows oxygen to flow more conveniently uh, throughout the composting pile uh, because of the biochar. And as we've seen, uh, the oxygen is extremely important for aerobic uh, respiration for bacteria. So it's. It's very, uh, it's very interesting. And then the, um, the organic matter decomposition. So because of, you know, this increased moisture resiliency, uh, the, the, this increased aeration, uh, the, 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 this, this redox um, properties leads to high temperatures. And what means that high temperatures, it means high uh, probability of weed seed killing, pathogens elimination, and also enhanced uh, organic matter decomposition. And by that, if the, the, if the organic matter decomposition is, is faster, then the composting process is faster. And the compost itself will be more mature. And by mature, I mean it will contain more humus. So, Theoretically, biochar is extremely interesting for, for composting. Now, what if we, we take biochar and we amend it with digestate? 
um, because digestate contains all of this uh, all of these nutrients here, but is volatile and is toxic. Um, but biochar provides sort of the matrix, the structure to keep all of these nutrients from digestate together uh, in order to uh, you know to to provide perfect conditions for the bacteria within the, bac the, the composting pile. That now. Next, uh, next to it, we have the yard waste uh, of the, uh, you have, we have 10,000 kilograms per annum of, of yard waste here. Um, so here came the, the, the idea, the study design. Uh, I, I wanted to, to test um, and to know whether or not the, bio, the, the digested and the biochar had important effect on the, um, on the composting process of yard waste. In order to know that, uh, I did this, uh, I did this, um, sorry, I always talk, talk about the first person, I should, I should say we, because I had tremendous help from, from the helpers, uh, from the farmers. So we, <laughs> we did uh, this, uh, we, uh, we designed this, um, this, this test mattress. On the first row, you have the digested piles, meaning you have the yard waste amended with digested. Then on the second row, there is the, the yard waste with digestate and biochar. On the third row, you have the, the yard waste together with biochar. And then on the last row, it's only, it's only yard waste. Um, and then the, the, uh, the, the, the goal was to record the temperatures uh, during 62, 60 days, but I recorded it for 62 days and then compare the, compare the, 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 the temperature profiles of these three groups. We decided to do three rep replicates per group for, um, for a strategy, uh, for, um, um, uh, 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 for uh, statistical uh, purposes. On the back side, we can, uh, we can see the, the greenhouse uh, of uh, Beatrice. And on the left-hand side, we can see some, some coffee trees. And the building is actually the one of Pacific Coffee Research. These are the temperature profiles after 62 days. So on the, on the left-hand side, we can see the temperature profiles of digested piles, then the temperature profiles of biochar digested, then biochar, and then controlled piles. The controlled piles uh, I should have mentioned it, is the, the yard waste without biochar nor digested. What we can see at first uh, is that just like, uh, you know, the composting process uh, side I've shown you, um, these graphs uh, show the temperature profile with, uh, as a function of time in days. First, uh, we can see that all th four categories exhibit uh, the a very similar, uh, very similar profile. Um, actually, I've uh, conducted an ANOVA, so an analysis of uh, the variances, in order to know whether or not there were a significant uh, in homogeneity in the in the temperatures of each group. And uh, actually, uh, the all of the all of the data, all of the, the the profiles are very similar. However, we can see that uh, on the the digested piles. Uh, between days 21 and, and, and 30, yeah, 33 or something, uh, the three, the three uh, replicates uh, exhibit very different, uh, very different patterns. Um, so is it uh, between the day 38 and 42? Uh, and uh, then the second thing I would like to add about this, uh, this graph is that it is extremely unconstant. So we have high, uh, you know, high mountainous like profiles and uh, it's, uh, it's not stable. In comparison, biochar and digested piles are, are slightly more stable. Um, also the, the, the three piles, so BCD1, BCD2 and BCD3 uh, are very, uh, are more similar to uh, one to each other as compared to the digested piles. Uh, so the first thing we can uh, we can say is that the biochar leads to a, a more a higher stability within the, the, 
the composting pile together with the digested. Then if we take, if we, take uh, if we have a look at the biochar bio piles, we see that it's, uh, it's, ama it's amazing how the first, the temperature uh, are almost always above 40 degrees until day 42. And that's for the three replicates in comparison to the, the two previous piles where the, the temperature of 40 degrees is, I mean, the, where the temperature profiles go uh, below 40 degrees already after three weeks uh, in, in, the, in, the bo in, both, uh, in the in both categories or groups. Uh, so what can we say about this? First is, is that digest state, um, you know, uh, digest state with its toxic effect of ammonia mainly um, decreases the, the temperature of the composting pile. Because when, it, when, when, it, when absent, the biochar, or the composting pile with biochar is, is much higher. I mean, much. It's about a few uh, Celsius degrees, but it, it makes a difference. And then on the daily temperature of the controlled piles, we can see uh, um, that the control three, the replicate three in yellow, is, uh, is uh, a bit, exhib exhibit uh, a temperature profile a bit higher than for the, the, his her two homologs, um, and is also the temperatures exhibited in this graph are also slightly higher than that of the piles containing digested. So, and second, the this uh, this category ex also exhibit more uh, instability with regard to the temperature uh, profiles. So. What we can say is that biochar amending, uh, amendment uh, to the composting piles provide stability uh, in, in terms of bacterial activity, which is reflected in the temperatures. Um, by a digest state uh, has, has uh, exhib clearly exhibits this toxic effect, but it also might be due to the high, high moisture of digest state, as, uh, as I said, Digested is contained of approximately 90, 95% water. So the water might have been too much for the, the composting process to, to, be, to be actually optimal. Uh, then um, the digested also contains, you know, as I said, this high, uh, uh, the, 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 the in, like important amount of urea and other organic uh, organic carbon use, carbonaceous compounds. And this might have, um, might have been uh, actually detrimental to, uh, to the bacteria because reaching a certain, uh, certain amount, it becomes toxic. And this is due to, uh, to actually osmotic, um, osmotic reasons uh, in, in the bacterial cell. And I'm not going to, do, to go into details here. If you want, you can ask the question later on. Um, so basically, that's uh, that's it about the the temperature profiles. But the main uh, main message is that uh, you know biochar and digested use in the composting pile uh, respect uh, respect overall an, an an expected temperature profile for the composting process. So this is this is a this is a success. Now, what about the aqueous color extraction of the four groups? First, I would like uh, to make a, a small comment of what, what is this. So the aqueous color extraction of uh, the four groups allows us to have an idea of how much humus there is in the, compost, the composting pile. Um, I repeat, the more humus there is in the compost, the more stable it is. The more humus, the better, because humus uh, actually is responsible for all of the compost benefits to the soil I've presented in the beginning of this presentation. Now, what, what, what does aqueous color extraction has, have to do with, uh, with humus? Well, um, on, on, the, on, the, on the bottom of this, uh, of this slide, you can see uh, this, this you know, these uh, different colors, these different uh, 
color to which a number is, uh, is given. And this number is called the humus number. And based, um, based on the composting, um, based on the, on the compost optimal um, characteristics of uh, actually the uh, 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 Department of Agriculture in Switzerland, uh, a compost ready for uh, horticultural and agricultural use should exhibit a humus number uh, less than 20. So we can see 20 here. Okay, it's about brownish, not so dark. And uh, now um, we we have uh, we have uh, conducted uh, this experiment to the to all four um, categories, and um, we can see from left to right. First is the control, also only the right, the, the, the yard waste. And it has, uh, uh, I mean, you, we all have different eyes, but it's clearly, uh, it's, clearly, um, uh, it's clearly lighter than the three other categories. So for me, it's about 25, 30. Uh, it's, about, it, it, it's about 25 to 30 as a humus number, which is not bad, uh, but it recurs it clearly requires more time for, for humus to develop and to form into the, the pile. Then the second one, the biochar, is uh, extremely dark, but I would like to, uh, so is the, the, the BCD, the, the biochar digested pile, uh, color extract. But for this, uh, it is due to two things. The first one, of course, is the presence of biochar, of coal, uh, which is black. So it might, it, it has impaired the, um, the, the real color extract um, of this experiment. So it cannot, it cannot, it, it doesn't really represent and reflect the true humus number. Uh, however, I've done it uh, and uh, it, it, we, can, we can actually see that the biochar compared to the beast, the, the biochar digestate is slightly lighter, meaning uh, that the biochar with the, uh, the digestate in the biochar um, takes uh, takes takes longer for the bio, the, the composting process to, to be completed, and this is uh, is confirmed by the the digestate uh, trial, um, the, which is a bit a, a bit um, darker than the control trial trial in the beaker. Uh, I don't know you, but me, I, I see something like 35, 40. So this confirms uh, of the previous, uh, the previous uh, statement about the, the temperature profiles that digestate uh, containing composting piles take longer, uh, ex exhibit a, 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 shorter, a, a shorter thermophilic phase. So is, uh, is above 40 degrees for a shorter time. Um, and thus it's, it's, uh, it's humification phase. So it's, it's time required to create humus will be longer. So now, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, I don't have uh, the two uh, set of results uh, I, would, I would have loved to present you, which are first the chemical uh, contents, the physical chemical, physical chemical contents of the, the composting, the, the, the end value end products, which are compost. Um, but it's still on, and uh, it will be uh, it will be added to uh, to my paper, and I would really like to send it to anyone who's uh, willing or interested in, in what I've done here. And the second one uh, is uh, the phytotoxicity test is actually using the, the compost we have produced here to produce some sensitive uh, species species, and it has been decided together with Beatrice to use salad and radish because first, uh, it doesn't take uh, a lot of time for the species to develop. Uh, since I'm leaving in three weeks, it's better if I have the results. And second is uh, because of course, uh, Beatrice and Werner are, are familiar with those species. So here we go already. Um, let us uh, conclude with these uh, bullet points. Uh, so composting. You know, composting, as we've seen, um, provides a high water um, uh, water holding capacity, and as uh, as I've said, uh, the the compost the, the the composting piles together with the 
with the biochar and digested uh, exhibited much much lower temperature profiles because of the biochar who retained the high moisture content of digested. So this is a direct this is a direct uh, indication that if composting uh, if compost amended with biochar is applied onto the, the, the land here on the side, it is more likely to retain uh, water and thus decrease the, the irrigation water pumped from the, the county system. And then uh, if the compost is used for nutrient holding capacity, uh, so taking advantage of the, of the digested and the yard waste, but it's especially yard, uh, digested uh, content, it's uh, in the future and that I hope not so far from now, um, it has the ability, it has a, the potential to completely annihilate uh, the fertilizer use, which is interesting. Uh, then of course it is gaining, it is a huge gain in time, uh, in, uh, in, in US dollars, in money, uh, because um, now uh, I think we can, we can say that the, the nutrient cycle on site is, is closed. Uh, meaning that no more uh, mono trips to the county transfer station is, recur is required by the farmers. So this is again in time, this, this is again in, in money, and this is again in happiness. And also um, the composting had the, 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 the capacity to kill seed, uh, weed seeds, uh, meaning no pesticide would be required to kill these weeds. And I can tell you from an interview I had with uh, Julia uh, Smith, uh, Smith Kibi, who is the wife of uh, Mr. Ralph, the president of the Macaulay Estate uh, Association here on, on the neighborhood. Most of, uh, or most of the owners of the properties here use pesticides to kill weeds. And we can also talk about this later, but it is extremely not sustainable. Then biochar with digestate uh, used as amendment to the composting piles are puff powerful tools. However, the mixture uh, must be carefully prepared. Prepared, how is we've seen the moisture, uh, the moisture of the of the digestate is can have tremendous uh, effect on the the whole composting process. And something uh, I didn't really talk about was the particle size, but this is the particle size of the biochar. Um, that, uh, that can trigger or not uh, a higher thermophilic phase. And in our case, the biochar was shredded uh, with the use of uh, the ATV we have the chance here to have on site. So basically the ATV just rolled onto to the biochar, which might not be the most efficient way to, to reduce coarse biochar uh, into uh, small, small size uh, particles. And the, the smaller the particle size is, the higher the, the surface area, and then the, the higher the probability to, to, to trigger, um, to lead to higher microbial activity, and thus higher temperature, and thus higher organic matter decomposition rate, and thus better humus. And now for a final word, the sustainability uh, statement here on the farm. So, um, the green, as I said, the natural cycling uh, is, is closed, so this is very in interesting. Uh, I would like, uh, I would definitely keep in touch with uh, here the farmers uh, to know when uh, this great moment will come that they, the fertilizer will be of no use anymore. Uh, the, the greenhouse gases um, is reduced with the, bio with the composting system here on site because of the the gasoline that is not used anymore to go to the country transfer station, but also because of the use of biochar, who actually provides much more oxygen to the composting piles and thus uh, decrease the, the greenhouse gases such as methane or carbon dioxide emission or nitrous oxide, but this is another thing. And um, however, uh, future influences must be uh, tested, you know, uh, especially uh, with regard to the water, um, water holding capacity of the compost on land and uh, the fertilizers used or not used. Um, so many, uh, many things are, many projects can be, uh, can be proposed uh, to, to extend this composting system. And at last but not least, um, uh, I would like to say uh, that, you know, this, this experience here for me on the island has been a, 
extremely, extremely uh, 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 enriching. And um, through, through many the, the discussions with the farmers, uh, it appears that the main things to keep in mind for any kind of agricultural system or, or organic waste system to, to implement is motivation, is availability from the farmers, from the people, is a high planning, uh, is constant for the collection of the waste, for instance. Uh, of course, communication and um, awareness rising. Uh, I think this is uh, very important uh, for everybody, uh, regardless of the generation and regardless of where we come from, uh, to, to communicate it to, uh, to the people, not to be afraid of making mistakes. And uh, of course, my English is not perfect, but I hope I could uh, give you a small hint into this, uh, this world that is composting. Um, and um, yeah, you know, um, that's it, especially with uh, climate change. Um, it is said over and over and over again that by the end of the, the, this century, about 80% of the population will, uh, will have to, uh, to move away from the coast areas. Uh, and we can just take into account, take into a, an example, the, the, the Kona airport, uh, which is directly at the coast. So some things will, be, will have to be done and somehow this is directly uh, linked to composting. As a final uh, slide, here is the station um, that we have come, that we have uh, built together uh, with uh, with Werner and Ben. Um, on the on the left hand side, you see the, the composting station, uh, which is a box station. Uh, under the blue tops are the composting uh, a, a two composting pile in process, uh, which are actually uh, really uh, really uh, efficient so far. There is a shack that provides electricity and water hoses for moisture content uh, of the paths uh, and also storage uh, space for leaves uh, or, or wheat. And then on the right hand side, we can see the biogas reactor uh, in blue. There are two at the moment, but another uh, actually there, in, there will be three in a couple of months. So I show this picture only to say that it is important to centralize biochar uh, bio, uh, biogas reactor and composting in order to decrease the labor force. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, this is part of the planning. And, and with this word, I would like to put an end to this presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, um, yeah very interesting. Um, I'm wondering if people have questions. If you do, uh, please. Um, Unmute and um, ask away. Absolutely. Hey, uh, um, just wondering about the biogas reactor. That I mean, that's creating biochar and and the digest data are certainly beyond what I think most farmers, certainly backyard gardeners, but even most farmers are doing in general. Although <clears throat> I have some friends that are doing biochar. But I'm just wondering what the cost complexity factor is for, for that, because it sounds like it's kind of key to what you're suggesting. Absolutely. So uh, I guess the, the question is uh, about the, the expenditure uh, regarding the biogas reactor. Um, is that correct? Yeah, and I just, I guess for a clarification, I might have missed it while I was feeding my chickens, but I did the... Uh, the biochar is actually, and the digest state are both the results of using the biogas reactor or using biochar in a different method as well. So I guess it covers both of those. You know, if biochar is, is created using a different process than the, the biogas reactor, I guess I was curious about both. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very important uh, point of the whole process, the, the cost. Um, actually, the biogas reactor um, uh, cost approximately, uh, um, I think, taking taking the shipment into account is approximately two thousand US dollars, um, maybe more. Werner would have uh, would have to to correct me uh, on this on this. Uh, the bio um, and then the, the the biochar, the kiln we are using is uh, is. Uh, I don't even know the price, but I expect it's not extremely uh, 
extremely uh, high. Uh, don't, I, I think it's lower than 1,000 US dollars. Um, but then comes, uh, you know, uh, then comes uh, all of the um, all of the time required for this, and uh, this is uh, this is a matter of uh, of again motivation. But uh, the 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 facilities itself is not extremely costly. It's actually cheap. It's uh, in the range of one to three thousand US dollars. Okay, and then but I'm thinking it takes. I'm off grid to one hundred percent, so I'm thinking energy. Okay. Can this might be important to those devices as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. They use? So for uh, for uh, for off grid uh, situation, this is uh, this is very interesting, uh, a very interesting low tech technology because of of course when you are off grid, I guess uh, you want uh, you want something that is uh, easy to fix, and uh, these uh, biogas reactor uh, are, are resilient actually. And they are small, so meaning that you can adjust uh, very, uh, very uh, easily and and rapidly. What is the input for the the biochar um, kiln? You said it's a kiln, so you, yeah, you a heat heat source burning something, I suppose, and the, uh, some of the wood. Is that where the yeah, uh, it's it. It's 100% wood biochar. So the wood uh, is uh, is actually comes from tree trimmings here from the uh, from the property, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, a high fraction of wood comes, uh, you know, from the the nearby forest that exhibit a high uh, uh, forest fire risk. So we are allowed to to cut like just one to two uh, one to three meters away from the fence. Which actually is part of of the property here, so this is the this is the sources of the wood, and it it needs to be to be um, to be to be dried for at least six months to one year before uh, before being charred. It can also be be charred without drying, but it takes much much longer. Sure, yeah, makes sense. William, thanks for the study. I I love these multivariate studies. You've got a lot of variables that you're. Uh, but that you're trying to sort out here. <clears throat> I have a question about the timing of this. It, if I read your charts correctly, it looked like you followed your piles of compost for a couple of months. Is that a typical the time period to turn things like yard waste and, and so on yeah. into soil amendments? Uh, absolutely. It is, um, <clears throat> it is a typical uh, for the composting process. It takes uh, I mean, some argue that the, that you know typically the Berkeley uh, composting method takes to um, take, takes uh, on, only three weeks, but I can tell you it's very unlikely that this uh, occurs. It's more between three months and 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 one year um, mm -hmm. to 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 reach a complete completely ready to use compost. Yeah. I noticed on your first slide you had highly variable inputs for your materials. Uh, would it help if you chipped this or macerated the um, the input yeah. materials? Would that shorten the time length of the processing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it's uh, actually the, the shredding is uh, one of the uh, of the crucial uh, phase of of the whole process, uh, and we. Uh, we we rely on the on the wood chips here we have on, on the farm, um, which uh, actually works with uh, with gasoline, but uh, it's uh, it's it's done uh, one once every other month. Um, also, the weeds uh, are shredded um, uh, with uh, with a fresh new tool, and it allows to make uh, a very to re extremely reduce uh, the the surface no to increase the surface area and to reduce the particle particle size. Um, and and the leaves as well. So this is important actually to shred the material uh, in order to re to increase their surface area. Yeah, absolutely. In the in the plots that you showed, um, it looked like. In every case, around day forty-two, there was a drop in temperature. Was um, yeah. 
Is that a, an ambient temperature? Uh, in, uh, uh, for like uh, a day 22. No, more, more like uh, 42. Uh, 42. Yeah, actually, uh, something, uh, yeah, it is sort of, it's, it's, oh, it's, uh, it's linked to the ambient temperature, but it's also linked to, uh, to the fact that um, uh, if you see like all of the piles actually uh, uh, decrease their, yeah. their temperature at this time. And it's also, uh, uh, it's because uh, here it's, I, I have turned this, the, the piles at day 42, and ah. this might have been the, the bad thing. Because of course, when you turn the piles, it provides oxygen, which theoretically would lead to, to higher uh, microbial activity. But the drawbacks of it might be that after, after some time, such as more than one month, uh, then it just kills the, 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 the microcosm you have in the pile. And uh, of course, then together with the ambient temperature, it couldn't reach up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for this question. I have a few more, but I'm hoping I'm waiting to see if someone else uh, has any questions. Bruce, I'm sure I'm sure you have a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how important are the size of the piles? Uh, I noticed that you did a pretty good job of keeping each all the twelve piles. Uh, yeah. Consistent. But it, if they had all been twice the volume or Ten times. Yeah. Would that would that affect the results at all? Actually, I think uh, I think uh, yes. The the results would have uh, the the old piles would have probably exhibited higher temperature uh, because the piles here uh, they are very small uh, in terms of composting piles. They are uh, about they are about zero point seven cubic meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is for the, the launching uh, of the experiment. And after after a while, uh, of course, the pile size, the pile volume decreases. I actually, after uh, when, when composting is completely uh, is completely done, the pile is uh, it has been uh, has measured to the pile volume has been measured to decrease by fifty percent. Mm. So this is also uh, one of the reason uh, that. You know that at uh, this point, I would say that that is day forty-two, uh, the temperature really decreased is because the, the 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 volume of the piles were not big enough to uh, to keep the heat to retain the heat, mm -hmm. and if the piles are big enough, uh, they retain the heat much better. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you had uh, ten times higher uh, bigger piles than the temperature would be higher, but then the the organic matter uh, co um, quantity would also be higher, which means the that I cannot say uh, that the composting process would be shorter just by its size. Mm -hmm. uh, just let me add a note. It uh, needs to be uh, noted that the bigger the piles, the more energy retained, and this is a uh, used also for, uh, say, heating uh, in, in off-grid situations, uh, in colder areas above the 40th uh, degree latitude. So uh, in Switzerland, there is a city with uh, several hundred people, uh, farmers mostly, who do a central composting, which then uh, he provides the heating for all the houses in the vicinity via remote heating. So uh, compost can also serve as a direct energy source uh, for, for low quality energy, energy like heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually the, the heat retention and the recovery of composting piles uh, uh, have been uh, yeah have been have been measured have been uh, have been tested for uh, for a long time, and uh, this is a promising technology as well. Yeah, absolutely. Had, I I presume each pile would have a temperature profile. The out, outside is going to be 
pretty much the same temperature as ambient temperature. And then the interior is can be warmer as you could get closer to the interior. Yeah. The how, temperature. How did you, how yeah, did you measure the temperature? So I took, uh, I took um, a stainless steel long, uh, long needle probe, uh, about 30 uh, or 40 centimeters probe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I just planted it in the, in the composting pile at about three fourth, uh, so, so three fourth of this height. So this is where the, 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 the temperature is the, the higher in the composting pile. This is where one should, um, uh, one should measure the temperature in the composting pile. Yeah, each time. Mm -hmm. But for, for this measurement, I've taken three, three temperature uh, per pile per day. Mm -hmm. And then did the, then did the, the average. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the, of the process, so uh, until day uh, six to seven, uh, the, these three temperature measurements, they were very different for each pile. But then after that, they were very, very similar. <laughs> so meaning at, uh, at, uh, after, for, from day one to day six, for one pile, I was taking the temperature and uh, I had three temperature different, uh, th three different temperatures, but like, for example, I have 35 and then 40 and then 42 uh, for one pile. And then after one week, I had 32.2, 32.9, 32.5 for mm -hmm. one pile. So it reflects the stability of the pile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I don't have any other questions. Um, anyone else? Guess not. Well, great. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you, uh, Will, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, thanks. Best of luck growing, growing lettuce and uh, and radishes. And uh, yeah. <laughs>